But today we start a new year, and I'm so happy to know that Pastor Roger has already begun to bring to us the 333. Well, I want to keep you in suspense because the 333 will be shared with you actually on the 15th of January, but because it's the installation, you have to wait until 29th of January. That's when I share the vision of the church. We are coming to the end of a five-year cycle, and as you know, the church has a five-year plan for what we're doing. And today we are beginning the fifth year. The fifth year, our emphasis is really on the elderly people. And some of you say, wow, then he's got nothing to do with us, you know. I think that's wrong. If you think that just because we're talking on the elderly people and it's got nothing to do with you, then it is wrong. Because we are talking about generation renewed and revived. Renewed and revived because even though they are old, they are evergreens. They are what we'll call the silver adults. And uh, 29th of January, we will have a new beginning for the church, and that is the SAF. I purposely use a very strong, powerful name for this group of people, the SAF, because they're the Silver Adult Fellowship. And that's the inaugural meeting. We hope that the business meeting of the church will end quickly. Uh, maybe we should let you know, our chairman know that. Uh, because on that day, we are going to celebrate and inaugurate, you know, the Silver Adult Fellowship. But thinking about this year, what does it have to offer to us? You know, Silver Adults talks about people who are old and have grey hair, and thanks be to God, I'm not one of them. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Actually, I'm the oldest staff of the church. Uh, I, I admire people with nice grey hair, like Tiong Hui, you know. Uh, you know, uh, that night at the wedding, I was just looking at his hair. You know, such a nice hair he has. Like I say, whatever it is, whether you have silver hair, gold hair, golden hair, uh, brown hair, dark hair, uh, you know, the important thing is still to have some hair, right? That's the most important. But thanks be to God, Ewan Brenner. In case you didn't know who it was, you know, he's one of the most sexy actors because he didn't have any hair. All right. So whatever it is, we are happy for the condition that God has given to us. But the Silver Adults Fellowship, we are talking about a generation that has so much you know, experience. And as someone said, I remember I was at the Ambassador Harry Chan's uh, birthday celebration, sitting next to the president of the NUS and Harry Chan at the time. And he was, I was giving a little speech, and I still remember how I said that, you know, the older generation, they're very precious people because they have a silver hair, they're golden teeth, they're precious, you know, stones in the stomach. And, uh, well, that's how we describe the silver generation, isn't it? But thanks be to God that the silver generation need not be something that you say, oh, pastor, you know, we don't have uh, much to gain from them. We have to give them, you know, uh, bless their ministry, uh, help them and all that. No. Remember the wisdom, how God has led this church from strength to strength. It's because of the silver generation. They have come to this point in which we look at them, not just with great admiration, but with respect, with honor. You know, this morning I greeted Mr. Tong. As you know, Mr. Tong is the oldest member of our church right now. He's 91 this year. The thing I admire about Mr. and Mrs. Tong is that in spite of the fact that they are of the silver generation, they take a bus to church to have lunch with the pastoral staff team. And then they also help us to reach out to the young people. You know, please, Mr. Tong is a good example of a young person that I say, as long as you're 99 and below, you are a young person. He was teaching the youth how to bowl. I'm sure some of you, you go bowling today, your arms will be aching, you know, so tiring and bad. But you know, Mr. Tong can still bow very well. He was coaching the young generation. So you see, we have a good example of a silver generation person here. But as you think about this new emphasis for 2023, the other emphasis on prayer, as we think about the prayer life of the church, this year, we're not asking you to pray more, even though that could be one of the outcome of it. 
But I want you to know that behind this emphasis on prayer, it's not about more postures of prayer, more prayer time, and, and just, you know, think of more things to pray about. It's not. But rather, it's about your heart. The heart, the new heart that God has given to you. A heart with a big capacity to contain as many people as possible. Roger just asked you to pray for one person who is still to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But your heart can contain many, many more, hundreds of thousands of people to love them, to pray for them, and to really allow God to use you to bring them into His kingdom. So before we continue that, let's stand as, as we read the Word of God. From Psalm 92, verses 12 to 15, and James chapter 5, verse 16b. Let us read together. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, The Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. James chapter 5. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Thank you. Please sit, be seated. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and most of all, the joyful obedience to His holy word. You know, today marks the beginning of a new year. Why do people always feel jubilant about a new year? Because it brings hope, new prospects, you know, things you've never done before, adventures you've never been through before. You know, God is going to stretch you far beyond your wildest dreams and imagination. But for us in NLBC, we already come to the end of our five-year emphasis. We have a vision about God helping us to not only love Him, but to reach out to people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be here for the community. We believe that God has brought NLBC here in the Taman Jurong area so that we can bless everyone in this community. But you know, this is a vision in which God has given to the pastoral team and the staff team as well as even you know, the leaders of our church. But today, as you think about the silver generation, we don't just look at older folks, but we look at all the wisdom, all the wealth, of uh, whatever they have that God has given to them, whether it's physical wealth or the wealth of knowledge, the wealth of skill, the wealth of talent, but most of all, the wealth of knowing God, of loving God, of being there with God from the beginning until now. You know, we think of a new year. New Year speaks about new beginnings, and that's what life is about. It's a series of new beginnings, just like Joshua and Marian. It's a new beginning for them. They're starting a new, a new home, a household of faith, and a new family. That is a new beginning for them. But sometimes, you know, uh, in order for us to live in the new life, we must bury some of the old things that entangles us, that drags us down. You not only need we remove them, but we bury them never to resurrect them again. But then on the other hand, the newness can also come from the old. And that's the other aspect I think about. Because the old have so much to offer us, as I've just reiterated just now. So, you know, we do not just discard old because old means redundant and bad. New means good and useful, not necessary. Because a lot of the new things comes from the old things. Just like you and I, we came from our parents. They gave up to us, they gave us principles and values to live by, and today we are who we are because God has blessed us the parents who have spent so much time and commitment to love us, to grow us, to nurture and to nourish us. But what has the Bible to say about today's theme? A generation renewed and revived. I think when you think about Psalm 92, you think the first word that comes to you is, they will be fresh and evergreen. So he's talking about old people. No, Psalm 92 is not talking about old people. But Psalm 92 is talking about the righteous, that the righteous will be like the palm tree. The righteous will be majestic like the cedar of Lebanon. The righteous will be fresh, fruitful, and evergreen. And the righteous will declare the glory of God, because they will declare to everybody the rock on which they stand by. So you see, this verse is not talking about 
older folks. But it's talking about righteousness that leads us from the young to the youth to the older and even to the older generations. Thus, today, renewal and revival. You know, I think it comes only from one simple word. And the word is righteous. Righteous. But when you look at the Old Testament, it's the word sadip, which means just, blameless, innocent. But then the Greek also have a similar word. And the Greek, the chaos, means just, blameless, innocent. Exactly the same thing. But when you think of the Old Testament, the word righteousness it's time a sad dog to declare righteous, acquitted, vindicated. But in the Greek, it's the kaisone, you know, which means justice and right. It also means to be justified, to be free, to be acquitted. You see the beauty of God's word. It has so many root meanings for us that one look at them, you have a, a very clear idea what the meaning of the word righteous is about. It's to be justified. That means you, are, though a sinner, are now made just as if you have not sinned. You and I, those sinners, are now set free. You and I, those sinners, are now acquitted because Jesus Christ, through His body and His blood, has set all of us free in the kingdom of God. So true righteousness can only come with a relationship with the right God, the upright God. So it begins with Receiving Jesus Christ. You know, I, I tell you, there are many people who think they're Christians. Just because they enter a church, just because they read the Bible, just because they pray. There's nothing wrong in praying and reading the Bible and going to church. It's wonderful. It's, I'm just so overjoyed when people are coming to church. But coming to church, reading the Bible and praying and even getting baptized doesn't make you a Christian. What will make you a Christian is when you receive Jesus Christ. As John chapter 1, verse 12 says, As many as receive Him, God gave the right to become children of God. We need to receive Jesus. Why? Because when you say you only believe, even the devil believes in Jesus Christ. But we not just believe Jesus, we receive Him into our hearts. So being right with God means that we have a right relationship with Him. That we have repented from our sins while receiving Jesus Christ, that we now want to live in the newness of life according to His Word. That's why we are freed, we are justified, we are acquitted. We are people who are considered as blameless, as innocent. Yes, we are still living sometimes inappropriately according to the Word of God. We may still have some of our weaknesses. Sometimes we fall into temptation. <coughs> But you know something? In spite of what we have done wrong, Jesus Christ gives us the power to overcome. Don't remain in the state. You know, there are some Christians who feel that it's okay for me. As long as I'm a Christian, I have a passport to heaven, I can do whatever we want or I want. It's not true. That's the lie of the devil. Because when you have received the grace of God, all the more you love God, you will not do anything that will hurt God or break your relationship with God. So this relationship is so important. Do you know why? Because the right relationship with God will bring about right thinking, which will translate itself into right behavior. So this right relationship is how you know what is right and wrong. This right relation is how you know what is good and what is evil. Because when Jesus comes into our hearts, we are not just aided by our conscience. We are aided most of all by the Holy Spirit who indwells us. You know, I think sometimes Christians still live under the Old, Old Testament. You know, we pray the prayer, take not your Holy Spirit from me. My beloved brothers and sisters, yes, King David prayed that prayer. He says, take not your Holy Spirit from me because he sinned against God by killing Bathsheba's husband and also having a sexual relationship with her. And, you know, he knew that what he did was wrong. That's why it says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit comes and go, comes and go. But we who are living in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit is not just coming and going. The Holy Spirit indwells us. He influences our entire being. He intoxicates us. That's why, you know, 
the book says, the book of God says that do not be drunk with wine. Do not be intoxicated with those small spirit, but rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, the Word of God says exactly the same thing. Do not be intoxicated with the small spirit, but intoxicated with the big spirit, the Holy Spirit Himself, who guides and directs our paths. So true righteousness can only be obtained when we are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. You know that Jesus Christ died for your sins and He has covered you by His death so that you are made right. You know, the Chinese, I admire some of the, the writings of the Chinese because it reflects all the biblical teachings, not just from Genesis, but even this word righteousness. As you see in Chinese, you know, it's very clear. You know, oh, sorry. I understand there's some issue with the, some, some hardware there or software, whatever way it is. Don't worry, we are not controlled by that. The word righteous has this simple meaning of a lamb over me. Young, war. The young is lamb of G Jesus Christ, the lamb of God. And me, when the lamb of God covers me, that is righteousness. You see, even in the Chinese character, it shows us exactly what is the meaning that God was trying to convey to us. So renewal stems from being clothed daily with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In my prayer just now, I talk about the armor of God. That one of the most important pieces of the armor of God is the breastplate of righteousness. Because this breastplate, it will really covers your heart. So it begins with your heart. Is your heart right with God? If it's not right with God, then everything else will fall into is on wrongful places. But when your heart is right with God, I believe that God will bring you to those high places which will honor Him and glorify Him. So it clothed, being clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ, but what are some of the reasons and results of righteousness? I think Psalm 92 talks about it very clearly. Firstly, it says the foundation is in house of God. It is in God Himself. The foundation of righteousness is not because the laws of the land of Singapore, the laws of the land of Australia tells us this is right, this is wrong. Or what is being spoken in, in Nigeria, what, what is spoken in South Africa, or what is spoken in the uh, Philippines, or what is spoken in Malaysia, what is spoken in Indonesia. I don't think it's about the laws of those lands, though we have to obey them. You know, once we were in uh, Austria, we wasted so much time. Because when we walk, we pass our car through the, this uh, balat, balat, you know, we didn't know that there was a certain timing in which they come out, and when they come out from the ground, you cannot leave the place. You only leave the place when you pay 100 you know, uh, euros to the police. So we had to go and look for the police station, plead it with them. We don't read Austrian language, we don't know what it is. But the inspector has no concern. She can't even be bothered to talk to us because she says, pay up, and that's it. That's what she wanted. Because that's the law of the land. But today, we're not talking about the laws of those lands. We are talking about God's foundation as found in His Word. That is foundational, that's fundamental, that's elementary, but that is the priority of our life the foundation that is found in God. But secondly, it says it flourishes in the cause of the Lord. You know, righteousness results in being flourished. You know, that means we are blooming. You know, blooming in the house of God. This is where you belong. The house of God is where you and I ought to be. Beloved, it's so easy to come under the lies of the evil one and say, Oh, it's okay, we can do our worship you know, in this place and that place. But why did God institute the church? God instituted the church so that as a local gathering of believers, a local assembly, we will do the business of God. Not just the business of worship, the business of breaking the bread and wine, the business of baptizing people but most of all, the business of discipling people in the Word of God. So we flourish in the house of the Lord. And thirdly, you know, another reason or result of being clothed righteous is that we are functional, just like the palm tree. 
The palm tree is so useful. You know, I used to go up to Malaysia, the North-South uh, Expressway, and I was thinking, my goodness, driving all this distance. After a while of driving, you know what happens to you? You and the road become one. Did you ever realize that if you're drivers? You know, after driving a while, you know, you, you just become one with the road. You're like the, you know, the, you became the car and the car became part of the road and you become one altogether. Why? Because it's a long distance thing. You know, driving along there, what do you see? Palm tree on the right of you and palm tree on the left of you. As you go further, palm tree in front of you. And then as you go even further, palm trees behind you. Everywhere there's palm tree. But you know something of the palm tree? The palm tree is one of the most useful trees you can think about. Last year in a spiritual retreat, we went to Botanic Gardens, and I especially wanted us to go to the Valley of Palm Trees. Because when you look at the palm trees, all the leaves are useful. You know, when we were younger, we lived in houses that are made of all these palm tree leaves. A top house, because they were used by, you know, the people to build their homes. And the palm tree can be used to build all kinds of things with its wood. And even the oil that comes from the palm. You see, the palm is such a useful tree. What the Bible is saying is that you will become useful. And you will be fantastic, fantastic, majestic. Just like the cedar of Lebanon. Because the cedar of Lebanon is used to build all the furniture in the house of God, in the tabernacle, and then in the temple. The cedar of Lebanon. And of course, the next thing is that you'll be fruitful, fresh, and evergreen. You know, the Bible tells us the beauty of being righteous. That you'll be a fruitful person. You know, last night I was, uh, I hope that you have listened to the little video, and I thank Mr. Tong for encouraging me this morning uh, with the video. He says, oh, yeah, you spoke very good, huh? very short or so, huh? a few minutes only. I say, well, I'm capable of speaking short messages too, you know. And uh, in that message, I, I did talk about, you know, whether this last year was a good and fruitful year, or was it a wasted year? Well, if it has been, then let's look at 2023. There will be a fruitful year. It will be fresh, evergreen. That whatever you do will endure forever like the kindness and the loving kindness of God, the faithfulness of God. But what are the recipes for righteousness? Basically, it is about being hungry. Being hungry. Because right at the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's very clear. Right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, He told us what it means to have a life that is right. It is only when you are hungering and thirsting for it. It's basic necessity. It's the necessity of life. You know, it's just like a song sung in The Lion King. You know, the basic necessities. But beloved brothers and sisters, is that basic to you? You know, today we are all thinking of Chinese New Year because we're going to have abalone, uh, shark's fin, we're going to have lobsters, we're going to have crabs, we're going to have prawns, and all these wonderful things. You know, we hunger for those things because Chinese New Year, there's certain food that you will eat. I'm a Cantonese. Of course, I always say I'm a niece, right? Because my father is Cantonese, my mother is Hainanese, my wife is Shanghainese, and I'm Chinese. So I'm a niece, you know? But you know what about Cantonese? Cantonese likes to eat that fat choy, you know? Fat choy is a black-looking kind of like hair. Young people look, eee, they don't like it. But you know what? In the tradition of the Cantonese, we will have that with oyster. Hosi, you know. So we normally have these two things, and we only eat them during Chinese New Year. And I thank God for a wonderful elder sister who maintains our family tradition that every Chinese New Year we will eat this dish. Because certain things we can eat only at certain times. But the Bible is talking about hunger and thirsting after righteousness. Is that what's happening to you? Well, Proverbs 16 verse 8 says, Better a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. 
How do you earn your money? You know, do you earn it with the right way or do you do it in a way that's not pleasing and acceptable to God? Where there's fraud, when there's cheating, when there's scam, when there's all kinds of deceit, beloved, better a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. Well, the second thing about the recipe for righteousness is that it must be humble. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Beloved, we need to be humble. Because humility means we know who our Creator is. That we, however great, however powerful, however you know, significant, with all the popularity, the wealth, the possessions, we are but dust. We are just the created. You know, people, every time you look at the mirror, you think how handsome you are. You remember the Edwin Lum joke, mirror, mirror on the wall, why another pimple more, you know? Sometimes we don't like that. Of course, older folks don't say pimple. Older folks say, why another wrinkle more, right? But I want to tell you this. It is not about the fact that, you know, we have all this uh, creativity, all this ingenuity, you know, we can do great things. But let's remember the first principles of life. We are the created. We are but dust. But yet God would make dust have such significance. And the greatest significance is He made us children of God because of Jesus Christ. So, right now as you think about prayer for the year, Let's never forget the prayer that we talked about since the beginning of this five-year plan. Remember, we talked about praying 7.14. Praying in the morning at 7.14, praying in the evening at 7.14, because it's come from that verse from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. You see, God has only one condition for you and for me. When you come before Him, and that condition is humility. Beloved, humility. Humility is what God deserves and God desires of us. So the next thing is trust God. Because righteousness comes by faith in the finished work of God. You know, Martin Luther, October the 31st, you know, our church was specially crowded. Car park here was very crowded. Do you know why? It's not because of uh, Halloween. It's because October 31st, the Lutherans celebrate Reformation Sunday. Reformation, when Martin Luther stood before the court, when the Pope and all these you know, great vulnerable people were before him, you know, he dares to say, here I stand on the Word of God. Because when Martin Luther read the Word of God, he came to this passage in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. It says, The righteous shall live by faith. Not by what you do. Not by all the good deeds. Not by being a good person. But it's by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it is all about. That's why faith is the only condition. And Hebrews chapter 11 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God because whoever wants to come to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who diligently, earnestly seek Him by faith. Beloved, righteousness comes by faith. But today, as you think about renewal and revival, you know, we think a lot about... Um, Wow, tongues of fire coming down. The whole church is set on fire. We're all wow, we're singing, hallelujah, and amen, you know. I tell you, that's not what revival is. It's only one aspect of it. Because true revival comes when you have a right relationship with God every day of your life. It's not about certain days. It's not about just Sunday. You know, sometimes Sunday we specially behave ourselves because, oh, it's the Lord's day, you know. We mustn't say words that are uh, displeasing to people. We must not do things that are wrong. But you know what? Sometimes over a parking situation, we get so angry. I've been a pastor for the last 35 years. So, you, huh? Wow, so long. Uh? 
Yes, it's a long time. I started for wanting to be a full-time worker for just two years. I want to do national service for God. Since I spent two over years for the army, I might as well spend two over years for God. But it's two over years, I become 35 years, you know. And I didn't expect that it's already 35 years. But I've been to church where we all worship God so beautifully. And next moment when you get down to the car park, somebody blocks your car. And this guy calls you by all kinds of four-letter words. And the word is not love. Beloved brothers and sisters, is that how we should behave? In church? In the house of God? But then, you know, sometimes we think that, oh, I should only be righteous, I should only be goody-goody on Sunday. Other days it's okay. Cheat on the coupon, cheat on the parking, cheat on, you know, whatever. I remember telling you the story of how one of my friends, he's a big-time lawyer, he brought me to meet his client. And at the client's Chinese New Year lunch. All he was talking about was how he cheated his wife. He's got two capable assistants and they will protect him when the wife calls. You see? Is that what it should be? I tell you, sometimes Christians, we do not live life the way God wants it to be. Like I say to you, my beloved brothers and sisters, there's no such thing as a bad Christian. Because if you are a Christian, you're supposed to be good. Jesus says, by their fruit, you will know them. A good tree will not bear bad fruit. A bad tree will not bear good fruit because a good tree will only bear good fruit. And if you have the goodness of God in you, that's what I'm talking about. A renewal, a revival in your life is a life that is living according to God's word, that you are living righteous, you are living good, because the Bible says before you know Jesus, there is none good, there's none righteous, there's none that seeks after God. But thanks be to God, by His Spirit, we love Him. We want to be close to Him. We want to do what is pleasing and acceptable to Him. And of course, Abraham, he lived by faith. He went out of, you know, the earth of the Chaldees. I always reminded you that, you know, there were no Jews before Abraham. But Abraham wasn't a Jew. He was actually an Iraqi. He was from Iraq, from Ur of the Chaldees. God called him and one day God says, I want you to go to this place, the promised land. You know, Abraham didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what he was supposed to do. He just knew that God called him to go to the promised land. And I'm sure when the neighbors ask him, where are you going? I don't know. What will you be doing that? I don't know. I mean, that's a very simple answer, isn't it? But here is the man who lived by faith. And time and again, the Bible says, God reckoned to him as righteous. God credited, put in his account that he was righteous because he trusted God. Beloved, that's what righteousness is about. You trust God. You take God at His word. And finally, of course, we obey God. You know, because obedience, that's what Jesus showed us. Obedience and trust is really the twin of our faith. Those are the most important twins. Jesus Himself says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. I'm not saying that you are preaching, or rather I'm preaching and you're listening to health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. But Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. You know, the things given to me may not necessarily be the best of health. It may not be the best car in town. It may not be the biggest house that I can get. But the things that God gives to me pertains to love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Beloved, that is what God gives to you and far more because it's given to you the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, when you think about obey, the Bible says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. When you obey God, you know you are a righteous person. A righteous person is a renewed, revived person because whenever you live your life, you think about what is the right thing to do. So, beloved, let's, you know, be right. Think right. 
Do right. You know, at the end of this sermon, if you forget everything I said, please remember this thing. Be right, think right, and do right. And you will not be wrong. Because that's how a Christian life should be. So, finally, renewal and revival cannot be generated by earthly maneuvering. You know, it's very sad that people think that, oh, if I go to church every day of the week, if I go to every prayer meeting, if I do all the good works, then I will get the pleasure of God. You know, my life will be so happy. You know, when I was a young man, I used to go to JB. Every Saturday, we'd take a bus to the JB terminal because the terminal is very next to the Holy Trinity, you know, Anglican Church. And there we are helped in the youth ministry and also to the community. But I remember one lady, she was dressed very shabbily. She was dressed with her clocks. But every Saturday, without fail, she would take the bus with us to JB to do the work. I later on discovered that this lady actually was from quite a well-to-do family. But she wanted to be dressed in rags because she wanted to be, you know, righteous before God. You know, righteousness cannot be earned by your earthly credits. It cannot, because righteousness is something that's produced by the Holy Spirit in you. The power is from on high, because you are given the greatest power on earth, the power of the Holy Spirit. And I trust that in this church, New Life Baptist Church, that we will not be slackened, you will not be sleepy Christians, apathetic. Why? Because we are so used to being like that. But when you come into the presence of God, when you allow the Holy Spirit to come and descend upon you, and the Holy Spirit is living in each and every one of you, let's arise, let's be awakened to the person and work of the Holy Spirit. So what then can we learn this morning? Well, someone says the righteous delight in the law of God. You know, it's so beautiful because it teaches us about righteousness. The righteous will not sit in the seat of scorners and, and all kinds of mockers, but the righteous delight in the law of God. And His ways are always the ways of God because it's like a tree planted by the river and is flowing and there's fruitfulness, there's abundance, and there's blessing. Beloved, blessed is the man whose heart is with God and for God. So are you righteous. If you are righteous, you will delight in God's Word. Nothing can rob you of the time with God. So do not walk in the step of the sinners, the wicked, or stand in the ways, but delight in the law of the Lord. Second, the righteous prayers are powerful and effective. You now, yesterday uh, was quite a quiet day for my wife and I. You know, we, we just went to the supermarket to buy some NTUC necessities. So it was a rather quiet day. But then somebody so sweetly deposited a pot of porridge outside our house. My goodness, it was so tasty. It's abalone chicken porridge. But then it comes with a note. Pastor, today is the last day of the year. I want to remember you. Because you not only brought many of my family members, if not all of them, to Christ. You even married two of my daughters. You conducted their weddings. And most of all, my 103-year-old mother-in-law, you even had the courage to lead her to Christ. And I felt so touched. Because you know why? I didn't expect all this. I can't even remember something else she wrote there. She said, you know how my mother came to know Jesus? Because one day my mother was having this bleeding so badly. I call you, you came and you prayed for my mother and the bleeding stopped immediately. You know, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Beloved, God answers prayer all the time. God answers prayer all the time. But sometimes the answer is not the way we want it because we only want the right good answer. Must get well. Oh, must be flourishing. Then is God's answer. But if it's something not so good, then it's not God's answer. 
But thanks be to God that the Lord answered my prayer and healed that older woman immediately, and she got converted. It is something I've forgotten even in my own mind. I was reminded yesterday with this little note. But beloved, it shows the power of God. As I say, there's nothing special about the anointing oil that I use, nothing special about my hand, nothing special about my faith, nothing special about my prayer. It is the power of God that was given to heal that older lady. And God gave her the salvation. Praise be to God. You know, this past week, 25th of December, 2022, must be one of the greatest moments in the Tan family. Because James Tan, his father, whom we have been trying to win for the kingdom, you know, finally, he prayed to receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Oh, glory be to God. And of course, yesterday was the last day of the year, and we heard another person at the same cell group, you know, who came to church only one or two times, but now has given his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God is the one at work, but beloved, pray, pray, and pray. Because when you are righteous, you will pray. You don't just say, I will pray. You know, sometimes if people want to tell you something and they don't like to do this, oh, let me pray about it. You know, it's like pushing the whole blame to God. No? I, got, I didn't do it because God never told me to do it. That's why, you know, when I, I pray about it, uh, but, you know, I, I didn't take action because God didn't move me to do it. Beloved, it's a very terrible way to, to answer someone. When someone says, pray, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know someone asks you to do something, let me pray about it, you know. Whenever you, a salesperson kind of asks you, you say, let me think about it. I think they know what's the answer. So pray. The prayer of the righteous are powerful and effective. Righteousness experiences exuberant, exuberant joy in Christ. Because in Psalm 85 verse 10, the Bible says that righteousness and peace kiss each other. Love and faithfulness are united together. And not only that, that when you are righteous, you shout joyfully before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know, a joyful person in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, first and foremost, is from a righteous heart. A heart that is pure, a heart that is blameless, a heart that is innocent, because it's a heart solely living, wholeheartedly given to God. And fourthly, in a righteousness, the natural posture is to proclaim or declare that God is upright and there's none beside Him. You know, recently I was speaking in some evangelistic meeting and I asked myself, should I use the same phrase I always say? Jesus Christ is not one of the saviors of the world. Jesus Christ is not the best savior of the world because Jesus Christ is the only savior of the world. You know, sometimes I feel that because of the context, the people I say, I better not say, you know. I think uh, that, that's not the right thing to do. Because people might get offended when you say that Jesus Christ is the only Savior of the world. But that's the truth. There is no truth greater than this. That is truth in itself because Jesus Christ loves you. That's the greatest reality in life. Beloved, let's declare. And finally, the righteous blesses and exhorts the nation. You know, the Word of God says, when a king's heart is right, the nation will be right. But in, you know, Proverbs 14, verse 34, it says, righteousness exhausts a nation, but sin condemns my people. Sin disgraces my people. Sin is an abomination to God. Beloved, your righteousness is not just for yourself. It's not just for your family. It's not just for your community. It's for the whole nation. Because your righteousness will bless and exhort the nation. So let us be right before God. You know, as I was thinking about this renewal and revival, oh, we would think that, you know, every time pray for revival. But what is revival? Revival is simply that you be right, you do right because you think right. That's what it's about. When you're right with God, you're doing the right thing according to the laws of God, and you are doing the right thing in obedience to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. That is how 
You are renewed and revived, beloved. Let us pray. This morning, I know that God is here. And He wants to speak to you. I'm sure that through His Word, it's a very simple word from God. Be right. Think right. Do right. Because righteousness is what you should be hungering and thirsting for. And righteousness, like the preacher of righteousness, Noah, he was blessed by God and called to do a big task to save the world. Why? He was a preacher of righteousness. But your righteousness exhorts the nation. It blesses the nation. Today will be the right day to be right with God because today is the 1st of January 2023. God has spoken. Will you respond to Him? My beloved, if you want to respond to God this day, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me in your heart. Father in heaven, thank you that you sent your righteous Son, the Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross for me. That through His death, through His blood, I know I've been set free. That today I'm vindicated. I'm justified. I'm freed. I'm acquitted. Because Jesus Christ is the one who paid for my sin. Today, Lord, I want to be right with you. Maybe the last many years, the last few weeks, the last few months, I have not been right with you because I've been affected by the pandemic, affected by my own emotional health, affected by my mental health. But today, Lord, I want to be right with you. I want to put on the breastplate of righteousness because, Lord, from which comes the righteous thoughts, righteous talk, Righteous behavior, righteous action. So, Lord, fill me afresh. May the Spirit come upon me that my soul desire, even for 2023, is to know Jesus Christ and His righteousness, to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. This is my prayer. If you have prayed this simple prayer with me this morning, you know I don't normally give altar calls so easily, but I want to, those of you who prayed this simple prayer with me, I just want to invite you to raise up your right hand. If you have prayed with me, just raise up your right hand. Don't be afraid. Yes, I see your hands, I see your hands, I see your hands, I see your hands. Are there any others? It's not for me to see. I'm sure that that is a sign of your commitment to God. If you pray with me, just raise up the right hand. Yes, I see your hands. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless all of you. Father, you've seen the hands that are being raised. But most of all, you see the hearts. That the heart's desire is to be pure and blameless, righteous before you. Thank you, Lord, that this day, on this first Sunday of the year, first Sunday of the month, we want to do what is right before you, to live a life delighting in your word, delighting in prayer, because that's what you desire from us. And Lord, as we come into this new year, may we know Jesus more and more and love him to know the length, the breadth, the depth of and the height of his love, and to live by this love every day. For it's in the name of the lover of my soul, Jesus Christ, that I pray. Amen.